Eduardo Martí, Martí Report, estamos en la Enran Conference en Buenos Aires, en el Hotel Sofitel, y tengo aquí al presidente del Enran Institute, don Tal Stefani. Thank you for coming, and it's a great pleasure to have you here, Thank Tal. Thank you for having me. And uh, you grew up in a kibbutz, is that right? Tell me about that experience. I was born in Israel uh, in the 70s, uh, and I, I, I was born in a, in a city, but my, my family moved to a kibbutz. A kibbutz is a nice name for collective. Uh, the Israeli Jews that moved from Russia and uh, you know, East Europe wanted to create this utopia of collectivism and communism in Israel, so they created those communes, and where there is no personal uh, property. I was not the property of my parents. I was put in a children's house, and I got to see my parents only from 4 to 8 p.m. every day. I was for the kibbutz. I was a property of the kibbutz. I had a number. On all of my shirts and my, my pants, I had mm. a number, 338. It's my number. <laughs> and I was like an ant. I always think about it that I was an ant in an ant colony rather than a human being. And uh, at the age of 13, I moved there about the age of 8, 9. At the age of uh, 13... I five years there, five, okay. Well, no, I left at so. 16. Uh -huh. But what really uh, changed my mind is at the age of 13, I got a tape recorder for my... Uh, my uh, bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah, exactly. Yeah. Parents, uh, present. And so I got it, I put it in my room, and then there was uh, a committee in the kibbutz saying, you cannot allow, you're not allowed to keep it because it's personal property. How, how about sharing it with everyone? So the committee decided that I can keep it only if I let everybody play their cassettes and my, the records. And I said, I don't you know. So <laughs> it's <too>. mine. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not, you know, this is mine. Huh. And I told my parents that I want to leave. Uh, and so it took me a couple of years. At the age of 15, 16, we, we moved back to, to the city. But that was my experience with uh, collectivism. And uh, how did you conceptualize that? What was wrong with the kibbutz? Why is so important private property? It goes against the human soul. Uh, I wrote a little book, uh, Sophie, uh, which was my way to communicate those ideas to my kids. And she's looking at an, uh, an anthill and, uh, you know, ant colony and her friend... Hormigas in Espanol, yeah. yeah. Leo is asking her, look <coughs> how beautiful they go in a line. They all follow the rules. They all know their places. Do you want to be an ant? And she's horrified. Me? An ant? Do I look <coughs> like an ant? The nature of the human being is completely different than an ant, right? If you think about a fox, if you think about an elephant, you think of, they all have different natures. And I think the ideal philosophy is to understand the nature of this thing, the mind, the body, everything, and what makes it work. And if you put this thing in an ant colony, it destroys itself. But going back to you, you suddenly discovered that you wanted something you didn't want to share, that you wanted a kind of, you have a kind of individualistic behavior, but you immediately conceptualize that, you t the kind of, you take control of your own life from their own? Or how did that process work for you? You know, it's a battle because, and I think in Argentina as well, everything works against you. Uh, religion, society, moral codes, uh, the government, the news, everything you hear, your parents, you should be good by serving others. You should be good when you're giving away. You know, from the time you're in a, you know, in a yeah. sandbox uh, with other kids, what do they tell you? Share. Share, yes. If you don't, you are a bad guy. Right. Just now, be good. Exactly. Now you look at your parents and like, but you don't share. Yeah. You don't give away your car to somebody else. Yeah. Why should I give my truck? Right? Yeah. And so they think that this, this, this uh, uh, very problematic morality that is in the way. And so until I read Ayn Rand, very late, I read Ayn Rand only when I was 40, we, I realized that this is all a made-up contradiction. Because if I can think about things from one perspective, which is I'm an egoist, yeah. this life, my life, it's is yours. important. Yeah. It gives value to everything else. When I die, the world dies. Yeah. You see? There's no value for me to pursue. So this thing is the center of the universe. I am the center of the universe. If it's good for me, then I'll do it. For instance, why am I sitting here talking to you? 
Well, but let's suppose you are playing tennis yeah. and you want to win the match. Yeah. And the ball that your opponent throws to you, you see that it's in, but you, you can call it out and win the match. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, you are just following your own path, you are being egoistic, yeah. but at the same time, you are hurting somebody else. Yeah. So this is, the, the, I think, the misconception about the world selfishness, is this is why Ayn Rand wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, to fight for the world. Let's think about it. Let's say that you are my opponent. Yeah. I know that the ball is in, and I call it out, and I win the match. <laughs> I get the trophy. Yes. I put it in my house. Happy. What happens that night when I go to sleep? What do I well, I, I know that I'm a little bit a cheater. Yeah. And I yeah. know that I don't deserve the prize. What would happen next? Well, you, are, are you asking me about my self-esteem? Yeah. <laughs> uh, self-esteem goes down. You call yourself a cheater, which you are, right? Or I am. Yeah. Uh, I will not win another championship. I will destroy my life. I will destroy my relationship with other people. Is that egoistic? No, I think the egoistic thing to do is to be honest. To call it in because it's in and maybe lose the championship but i will win 10 more like roger federer because <laughs> i know that i'm honest and i'm noble and i'm virtuous so people think that the word selfishness is two things one is being for me which is good but also being dishonest and iran has this beautiful term called package deal so they, they have been put together They're two different together. concepts you know why they're being put together why to confuse you <laughs> so they tear it that apart and she says, get rid of the lying, you know. Why do they want to confuse me? They want to control you. Why do they want to control me? They uh, get more uh, for you serving them, right? It's, oh. I, I don't think it's good for anyone. This is why everybody self-destructs. Do you think that the uh, uh, politician... Uh, up there with all the power, he's living a good life? No, he's miserable as well. Everybody is suffering in the, in the you mean world that of uh, self-service. Uh, sorry, the serving the other, what Ayn Rand calls altruism, the virtue so of altruism. Why are they seeking power if that's going to make them unhappy? They don't know that? Because you they were taught by, we're talking about those, you know, powerful things that you get as a kid, right? Uh, if it's uh, your uh, religion or your parents, whatever you suck in as this is the good, this is the, w the way our mind is programmed, and we are machines, if you will. I'm not going to call machines. We are human beings mm -hmm. that are programmed to go after what we think is the right thing to do. And they, in a way, tell you, being uh, selfless, being altruistic, caring about others is the right thing to do. That's so, why we love to hate uh, successful business people, right? Oh, they're successful. Something's wrong with them. They're too selfish. Right? Either then idolize them like Ayn Rand is doing in an And uh, how, did you, how, how did you regain control of your own life? Just how do you change that approach after living so many years in a kibbutz? And mm -hmm. when that happened, you mentioned that you read her. And rant, yeah. and uh, that help you in which specific ways? Uh, do you remember exactly? For example, how did she change your philosophy? Yeah. Could you explain that to our I public? It, uh, so I, I did that when I was forty years old. It was nine years ago, and I call it the violent year. The violent year <laughs> of my life. Why? Because it felt like, uh, you know how drug addicts go to, uh, to rehabilitation yeah. Yeah. and they suffer through a process of change. Yeah. Changing your mind, changing your body. That's what I felt is happening to me. I had to reprogram my mind and I had to suffer. Why? Because the front of my mind was understanding new ideas. But the back of my mind was still working <coughs> on, on, you know, notions and, and on, uh, very well in, kind of integrated, ingrained things in me. I'll give you an example. I decided that some of my family in Israel is not good for me. So I decided to move away from them. So I'm, I'm in my car in a stoplight, and I decide that I'm not going to, to, to talk to them anymore. And I start crying. I just start sobbing, crying and crying. 
And I was happy about it because I knew that this is the process of change that happens to me. It's my front of my mind deciding something and the back of my mind, which is the part that is much faster and you know, more like a emotions emotions or the subconscious is trying to understand what it means. So there's a fight. So it, that back of my mind is, is sending signals to the front of my mind. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. And the front of my mind is powerful enough to say, no, I'm going to do this. And to the back of my mind is now warning if you feel well. How do you know yeah. if you have to follow your thoughts or your emotions? What's wrong with following your emotions? There's nothing wrong with following your emotions if you understand what they are. So Ayn Rand, I think if there's one big thing that I learned from Ayn Rand is the role, what, what, is, that, what, are, what is my reasoning mind? What can you do? What is this function? And what are my, my emotions? Emotions are almost automatic evaluations. But behind the emotions, there's an evaluation, which comes from a thought. So if you understand, you, the, 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 the tools of my survival is my reasoning mind, mm. which then gets integrated over time into the back of my mind for me to work. Now that I'm talking to you, I'm not talking, thinking about rationally about every word that I'm going to say. The back of my mind is so fast that I can say what I want so quickly. That's yeah. the function of, the, of your subconscious that allows you to remember everything and integrate everything. That back of the mind, the way it, 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 it judges, like if you slap me in the face right now, I will automatically think it's wrong. Why? Because the back of my mind is saying, this is threatening you. Yeah. And it transmits it by emotions, emotions of fear, of anxiety. I'll give you another example. So I decided to leave a, a VP position in a big company to start a new company or join a, a, a new company. And the back of my, so I knew rationally that's what I want to do. I'm going to take that risk, I put some money aside, it'll be okay. The back of my mind created anxiety and said, what are you doing? Just oh, security. Don't, 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 don't leave. leave. Don't leave. <laughs> it's making so, what will happen? You're going to start traveling. What will be? So that, if you understand the emotion, is not the way to make decisions. It's okay to listen to your emotions to say, what's happening in the back of my mind? There's maybe a gap between what I think is right and what my emotions are telling me. The beautiful thing is where you get all of your system in order. The emotions and the rational mind are aligned. Yeah, but be because you can feel contradiction otherwise. Exactly. And this is what I think a lot of people are suffering from, knowing that they wake up in the morning and they want to do something for themselves, to you know, get a better job, to do something for themselves, to break away from their family, to move so to somewhere else. But there's a guilt. Are you telling right. me that this philosophy is not just that helps you to have a view of the world, but to take control of your own life? I don't, I can't think of anything else that guides a man's life other than philosophy or what's more important than philosophy. This is what I, I find so exciting about my role today in the Ayn Rand Institute. It, I, I explain to people first and foremost, it doesn't matter what, but you need to realize that you are governed by philosophy. The way you think, the way you act, your personality, your decisions, your happiness, your misery is all governed by your philosophy, which is a set of ideas. And there are competing philosophies. You can choose which one you want. You are the, the one, but if you choose the right one. When you find a population like the Argentinian, 45 million, that full of immigrants from everywhere, nice people, but at the same time so much confused that for the last 80 years we have been chosen decadence and we paternalistic governments and because we really think that they are the ones who are going to make us happy. Mm -hmm. uh, to give us some political advice and some ethical advice to the Argentinian population. They are listening to you. You know, I, I will try to avoid political because I, I believe that politics is a derivative of individuals making their own decisions. The tragedy is that when you're born to, let's say, a family or a community that tells you from the day you're born, the right thing to do is to sacrifice. And the educational system. The educational system that teaches you, right? Uh, and you're getting mixed messages. It's good to get a get good grade for you, better than all of the others. But on the other hand, you should not be proud, proud about it because you have to be modest. All kinds of contradicting messages. You have to really be a hero, a genius, to break out 
and say, hey, all of this is wrong. I'm going to be in it. But most of us are not, don't have that. Uh, if you think about Ayn Rand being born in, in Soviet mm -hmm. Russia, ah. she was a genius as a kid, or even to start kind of breaking out and looking at everything from the outside. Most of us cannot do it. So my advice is educate yourself. You've got internet, you've got the Ayn Rand Institute, you've got the Ayn Rand University app on your phone. You can download and start listening to other people talking about what's right and what's good. And you decide for yourself. Expose yourself to other schools of thought and you would be the, the, the you know, deciding. Um, um, I can tell you that. One at a time, right? So one each person, at a time. so we need to change any Argentinian mind to change the country will not be possible to do it before that. That's it's, it's an edu I think more, more than anything, and this is why I love the fact that the Iron Institute is an educational institute more than anything, is to educate and to challenge the educational dogmas of, of, of altruism and collectivism. And um, I think what will save the world is just the explosion of knowledge. And people are smart. They know how to identify uh, where something makes sense to them. So what we're doing here with 200, 220 people here in the room right now, right, is the beginning of it. And hopefully, if you think about it, every one of them talks to 10 people, and then all of the other people coming to next year and educating themselves about Ryan's ideas, we can start a revolution maybe. Well, I hope we will. I would like to explore a little bit about what's coming to the world and what's going on at Silicon Valley and uh, this new robotic and this uh, intelligent revolution. What could you tell us about that? So uh, I spent about four and a half years in the Silicon Valley growing a, a software company and I think it's an amazing place. It's uh, the mecca of technology. It's where everybody goes to create a new company and be around venture capital who can help you bring, you know, bring yeah. your company to life. It's an aggregation of the smartest people in technology. But it has a, an amazing dichotomy. The, the most creative, productive people that I've ever met. On the other hand, they're governed by uh, an altruistic collectivist uh, ideas. And what's amazing to me is that you can go into a business meeting and people are the most rational, uh, self-centered, uh, kind of rationally self-centered, um, trying to make the most profit possible, right? To create the best product and, and yield the best profit. You get out of the room, you go to lunch, you talk about politics, suddenly it's about others and making others and sharing your wealth and, and so on and so forth. And when you, you um, challenge them to say what, where does it break that in business we are self-centered and we want to make profit, but on, they say that's the way it is. The There's, power of morality. Yes, and exactly, the, and you cannot reconcile it. When it gets abstract and philosophical, who knows? You know, it's good because we think so, or we feel so, right? So I uh, found that it doesn't mean if you're a great producer, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a great uh, philosophical thinker. So I think it takes a lot of honesty and integrity to say maybe what I'm thinking in the philosophical realm is wrong. And I've, and I've, I've converted a lot of people that said, you know what, let me think about what who should I read in order to understand what you're saying. Because I was having lunch with people and I say, I think you're, you're wrong to say that we should care for everyone and the most important thing are the poor or the handicapped. Because everybody immediately asks you, what about the poor? What about the handicapped? I said, why is that the most important thing? Right? What about you? What about your life? What about your kids? What about the, the people you care about? Are they more important? Then, of course, we should talk about the handicapped. We should talk about how, you know, I think if we all be more selfish, you will see how the poor gets out of poverty. In the most powerful, uh, most powerful way, like you saw in, in the, you know, in that the connection. Universe. Not everybody yeah. can do it, but in uh, what would you answer to people telling you? But you don't care about people. Just they are, uh, They need education. They need help, yeah. and uh, they need some other. Maybe they have the means to procure their own uh, well-being. So right. what do we do with them? I would say I'm the most uh, 
philanthropic person, that I'm, I'm more philanthropic than all of them put together. Because I know exactly how to get a poor kid out of poverty. I know that the Chinese kid who is now working below minimum wage in a factory for Apple is making sure that his life is getting better and better because before he was working in a rice field. And the left people will tell you, oh no, you cannot, you're not allowed to do that. You're going to have to give them minimum wage. Well, actually, we'll get him fired going back to the rice fields. And all for the sake of altruism. Well, I am, as a capitalist, as a, a person who uh, believes in individual rights, in, the, in, in, in rational self-interest, know that when the society is becoming more individualistic, like China is becoming right now, prosperity happens, more production happens, and then everybody gets more educated, out of poverty. I would rather be a poor person in, a, in, in the U.S., the most capitalistic uh, society we know, than, uh, than a handicapped person in, in a social environment where everybody cares for each other. Let me tell you another story. In my kibbutz, there was a member, and uh, her mother was suffering from cancer. She was knocking on doors to ask for money. Nobody would give her any money. You know why? why? Because they already given her, her their lives. Right? We're suffering for you. We're sharing everything with you. Now you're asking us for money? So what happens in that kind of environment, socialistic <laughs> environment, is everybody hates each other. <laughs> because we're forced to love each other, so we hate each other. The That's right way a little bit what that. has happened in the Argentinian society too. They become more aggressive. They don't treat each other well. Right. They, they, you look at some other people like a potential enemy instead of a friend. And you know what happens in my hometown in Alpharetta, Georgia? Everybody's smiling. No, but I'm, I'm sitting in Have the, a good day. Have a good what day. What can I do for you? They don't. They, I never hear a horn of a, of a nobody. Oh. Nobody. But the contrary here. The, yeah. Why? Because we're all individualists. We like our lives. We respect our lives. We respect everybody around us to have their own lives. You know, today yeah. in the papers of Argentinian papers, you can read that Argentina was selected by its own people, like the less happy people in the world. And I think one of the reasons is that we know that the country has a great potential, mm -hmm. full of smart people, right. but they don't find our own way. Because we just, we want to be protected and cared by government. And so you just prove the power of philosophy, right? Because the, the people in the US are not smarter than the people in Argentina. Uh, it's just that the governing ideas in people's minds is what's different. And the reason why in Alpharetta, Georgia, where I live, well, I just think about how many people want a US visa versus how many people want Argentinian visa. Why? Uh, and you think about the, 90, the 19th century, where there was, was no, no uh, safety net. Nothing was guaranteed. They were coming. Why? Millions. Why? Because all you need in order to prosper as a human being, not as an ant, <laughs> right, yeah. is freedom. It is the freedom to do what you do and if you succeed you succeed if you fail you fail it's the land of opportunity just i will profit from these beautiful insights you are giving us just to understand a little bit the situation in middle east can you tell me a little bit about the arab world and israel yeah. and what they would, would how do we uh, would how we should interpret that i think israel is a wedge of civilization in a barbaric world that's why Israel is getting so much heat. Um, Israel is a Western civilization, a thinking, a rational society in the midst of barbarians, where it's all, uh, you know, uh, tribal and uh, irrational, mystical, right. mystical, irrational. Uh, I'm not afraid uh, for Israel because I think Israel is smarter than all of their enemies put together. I am um, frustrated that Israel could crush their enemies in a matter of weeks. Like, I don't know if people don't remember, but when Menachem Begin decided that yeah. Iraq uh, nuclear uh, plant is a threat to Israel in 1981, he sent F-15, F-16s, we, we bombed, bombed them, destroyed the whole uh, nuclear program of Iraq, Iraq, and it was done. We can do it today with Iran, but Israel, again, is not 100% rational, and this is why it's not crushing its enemies. I believe the best way for your enemy, if you ask me what's best for the Palestinians, is for them to be crushed and eliminate their, their, their leaders right now, their you know, mystic leaders, 
and allow the rational people who want to live a better life to come up and think what happened to Nazi Germany after, uh, uh, the, after the World rebuild War II. of the, the country, to Japan, Japan. Exactly, after two uh, nuclear bombs. And South Korea too. And, uh, yeah, so, oh. so in a way, I think Israel should just not hold back. And regardless of what Europe says, even regardless of what the U.S. says, it should take care of itself, crush its enemies, and educate them that there's a different way. And until they change their philosophy, uh, there, there's no negotiation. I don't believe in negotiating with with, uh, with evil people. There's nothing for you to gain. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The, one of the problems in countries like Argentina, where the political system works so badly, but at the same time is still alive, the change has to be good. What, what do we do in Latin America with Venezuela? Uh, that's you, I, I, you know, I am that's a lost really, country. It, Cuba. Well, but that's the, people think, oh, they will just see what happens and they will understand. No, we have tens of millions of people dying in, in Russia and everywhere it was tried, in China. Yeah. It, it's not about seeing the evidence of where socialism and collectivism leads to. People don't understand that. They need to under see the relationship between ideas and reality. And they need to understand why individualism, as a moral system that Ayn Rand puts in front of us, yeah, the virtue of selfishness, the virtue of thinking about my life, wanting the best for me, so the baker of the bread mm. is baking for him, not for you. Right. He wants to make the profit so he can take care of, of his loved ones. He mm. doesn't care about you. But with the output of that is that he makes great bread mm -hmm. or great coffee or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And you enjoy it and you make cars. Yeah. So he gets to drive a nice car. You get to eat great bread. And this amazing win-win-win-win system is, is what is the solution. How Venezuelans or Argentinians or whoever would get that idea is through education through having uh, conferences like this that your dear sister is organizing and, uh, and I think this is the way to start propagating a different code of morality that will end up... Uh, you know, I think uh, you asked about Israel. Israel is socialistic, but in, in individual terms, yeah. every Israeli is very selfish. Well, they Argentinians, yeah. a little bit, they are like that. It's still mm -hmm. more naive, I think. But uh, I, I think that the germ of uh, just changing is inside the Argentinians. We once built a good society that attracted people from all around the world, yeah. and we can do it again, right? Yeah. With your there's, help. There's always, there's always hope. I hope really that you can visit us very often. Thank you for Great coming. Great pleasure to have you here, Thank sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.